Sai Ram. You're listening to Sai Soul 100, a weekly podcast series with soul, or stories of unconditional love, shared by devotees of Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba in celebration of his 100th birthday. We invite you to listen in on these motivational stories of his constant loving presence in devotees' lives. Offered at his lotus feet by the Sri Satya Sai International Organization USA, Mid Atlantic Region. Welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sai Ram, dear listeners, our guest today is Sister Prashanti Kamala, joining us from Fairfax, Virginia. Prashanti was born into Sai family and grew up being surrounded by bhajans, balvikas, and service activities while in India. We are looking forward to hearing her story of Swami's unconditional love. Sairam Prashanti, welcome to Sai Soul 100. Sairam Sister Peraba, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my experiences with our dear Swami, who is ever present. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I know that once you got married and moved to the United States, the distance from Swami struck you deeply and you were longing to be connected to him again. Can you share your story of how Swami came back into your life and showed his presence after you moved to the United States? After I got married, I felt a little bit of disconnect with Swami because back in India, I used to attend bhajans, balavikas, and study circles and seva activities. But coming here, I didn't have any of those even though I was regularly conversing with Swami and reading his literature, but still I was deeply longing to connect with another Sai devotee wherever I lived. So this continued for a very long time. But slowly I ended up getting a job. And then while I was at job, uh, my co-workers would come to me and ask, I was wearing a chain with Swami's pendant. So they would come, look at the picture and ask me, you know, who is that person? Is that your father or is that your husband or is that your friend? You know, I would get so many questions every day, whoever would look at that pendant. I had to explain to them that he is my guru, he is my God, he is my spiritual teacher all the time. And this continued for a very long time. After those incidents, I would joke with Swami say in my mind, saying that, Swami, you have devotees all over the world. How come nobody is recognizing you? It's, I mean, I have to say it's just my sheer ignorance, you know. So I would constantly joke with him and nobody ever recognized. Uh, but slowly, you know, I was introduced to bhajans. I started going to bhajans. Of course, people over there, the devotees over there know Swami, but I was still looking for that blissful experience. I, I, I was longing for that blissful experience when a stranger comes to me and recognizes Swami and says, oh, I know him. You know, that was deep inside of me. So fast forward, uh, I had my first child and then I was pregnant with my second child. Uh, What happened was, you know, in the first trimester, I developed pregnancy complications. But the doctors assured me saying that this is quite normal in the first trimester. But once you enter into the second trimester, this should resolve itself. So I was hoping too, even though it was a little uncomfortable, but I was hoping that the problem would get resolved. But what happened was once I entered into the second trimester, the problem became a life-threatening complication. Wow. The doctors were worried because they thought this is quite normal. It would resolve, but it became a life-threatening situation and they had to make a quick decision. So they gave me an option saying that, you know, in order to save your life, we had to abort the baby. That is the only option left. At that point, the doctors were very worried about my life. If I would continue the pregnancy, uh, 
I would I could not be saved. So they decided the date for the surgery, and uh, I was admitted in the hospital. My parents came, my sister's family came, of course, my husband and my older child, who was then two and a half years old, they were all there. I was admitted to the hospital and the doctors were in a dilemma, like what kind of a surgery can be done? This this turns out to be a specialized surgery, it seems, where the mother has to be saved. Right. Can be saved, yes. So it took like three or four days for them to discuss and they had to call in a special surgeon for that. When we went to the hospital, my mom carried a big uh, Swami's picture this time, a big frame so that it was kept on the uh, table next to my bed. The same story would continue. The doctors would walk in, the nurses would walk in and look at the picture and they would, some would say, oh, who is that bushy hair person? Is that your, you know, father or whoever it was? And someone would say, oh, I love that Afro wig. And, yeah. And some nurses would say, you know, oh, he's a very handsome person. You know, and the same thing, nobody recognized. But this time, all that fun was gone in my mind. I was really mad and angry with Swami for putting me in this situation. So I was still fighting with him. See, nobody recognizes. Why are you doing this to me? You know, why me? You know, what will happen to my child? What is it going to happen? I was mad. I was angry. I was sad. A lot of emotions were going through me. I was distressed. So... Finally, on fourth day or so, you know, <clears throat> the doctors decided the time and the date. And um, I had to sign all the consent papers. I know what I'm signing. You know, I, there's a chance that I may not come alive from the OR. Mm. I was still mad with Swami. I was still angry. I was sad. So many things. Questioning him. Why me? Why this? Why that? How can my child be? What, what will happen to my child and all of those things. This is so, your older child that you're talking about. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah the, I already have the older child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was worried about my older child who is just two and a half years old then. Yeah. And while they were wheeling me into the OR, you know, this time my mom, because the, that Swami's big photo frame was too big. So yeah. she gave me a small, you know, pocket size, small paper picture of Swami. Uh, my mother and my sister, they put Vibhuti in my mouth and put it on my forehead and gave me the picture. And they said, just hold on to it and hold it close to your chest. Swami facing towards your chest. Just hold hold on to it and he will take care of you. So I went in into the OR with Swami's picture in my hand. And I was lying on the bed so because of the enormity of the surgery. I had to be given a full body anesthesia. So while the anesthesian is prepping me, uh, he saw me holding a, something in my hand. He didn't see what it was. So he just said, you know, whatever you're holding, you know, once the anesthesia kicks in, you will become numb. Your hands cannot hold that anymore. Do you want to give that to me so I can put it on, on the table next to my bed? Yeah. Immediately I said, no, 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 no. This has to stay with me. I want to hold on to it and this has to stay with me. He realized that I am not going to let go whatever I'm holding. So he went to the chief surgeon and talked to him. And the chief surgeon came to me while I was lying on the bed. Um, you know, the chief surgeon was <clears throat> right behind uh, my head. He was standing right behind my head. And he said, ma'am, um, I can pin that whatever your that picture to your gown close to your chest so that you don't have to hold on to it. It will be there wherever you want it to be. I was so happy with that idea. I said, sure, that would be a great thing to do. Then he said, do you want to give that photo to me? Sure, sure, take it. And I was, you know, I, Swami was facing towards me while I was raising my hand and giving that picture. Halfway through, Swami was facing a uh, surgeon's face. The picture didn't even reach all the way to the surgeon's hands. Halfway through, the surgeon looked at the picture and he said, 
Is that Sri Satya Sai Baba? Hmm. Yeah. I was, I, uh, if I were not hooked up to all those IVs and tubes and everything, I would have jumped out of the bed. But I was so weak because they didn't give me, they didn't let me eat anything for until my surgery. They were just giving liquids to me. My voice was feeble, yet I was screaming, do you know him? Do you know him? I was, you know, on the bed, was up screaming to him, do you know him? Do you know him? And he immediately replied, yes, of course. You know, I would, every summer, I would go to Whitefield Bangalore Hospital to serve there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes, Biraba. So with that words, you know, my mind became totally blank. And my heart filled with gratitude. And knowing that he is watching over me. And I was never alone. Wow. While the anesthesia was kicking in slowly, I closed my eyes. So I don't have words to say. I totally surrendered at that moment. I was fighting with him all along. I just realized that divine timing is the perfect timing. Yeah. And yeah. You were Listen. teasing him saying that nobody knows you. Nobody knows you. Exactly. A crucial moment. Yeah. He waited all these years for someone to recognize him. And I couldn't even express my words. So, yeah, I came out alive with Swami's grace. They aborted the baby and I was alive. I came out alive. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this. Oh, um, very, very grateful to Swami for showing himself at that crucial moment when you needed him the most. And then when you came home after the surgery, right, I'm quite sure your family must have been pretty concerned about your well-being. How did Swami help you uh, overcome this? Yes, like you said, you know, after I went home, my family was very worried about my physical health and my mental health. You know, a mother losing her child. Right. Yeah, I came home and my sister brought John Hislop book with question and answers in that. That was lying on the table. I came home, I rested for a little while, not knowing how to feel. I, I picked up the book and, the, and for next couple of months, I was completely immersed in that book, reading the question and answer and question and answer. There was no sorrow in me. My relatives were concerned about my mental health. My family was concerned about my mental health. They thought I should talk to, I should get some sessions or something. But I don't know what had happened, but I was blissfully reading that book. Question and answers and getting insights for the present, whatever happened, for the future as well. I was reading question and answers, the entire book. I don't know why my sister got it and left it on the table right there. For the next couple of months, I read and reread and reread. And that's how I coped my stress, my sorrow, my loss, Swami's grace. I didn't feel that just by reading his books and getting immersed in those question and answers and getting those deep insights. Wow. So he, he did, you know, you did go through a tough time, but he showed his presence and he showed that he's actually watching over you. And he even gave you those that book um, as a resource for you to con continue to connect with him so that you can you can spiritually grow from this very tough experience, life experience that you had gone through. Yes, exactly, Pirava. While I was thinking, while I was reading and reflecting my thoughts and my wishes for the past six years, you know, my wish of stranger recognizing Swami in a pendant or in a ring or 
on a cover of the book was very insignificant. But yet, our dear Lord, he fulfilled my wish in a most profound manner, I would say. Yeah. I always feel that, you know, so in Sai's kingdom, there may be a delay in getting our wishes fulfilled or prayers being answered, but there is never a denial. Very, very touched by your story of recognizing that there is never a denial and that Swami is always watching over you. Actually, in fact, you know, Swami is always watching over every single one of us, right? Yes, exactly. Swami is watching over each and every one of us. It's just, we just have to realize that. Thank you so much, Prashanti, for sharing this powerful story. It's amazing how you were able to see Swami's presence during your toughest of life experiences and were able to spiritually grow and actually learn the meaning of true surrender. And so thank you for being with us today and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so much, Jay Saira. Jay Saira. Dear listeners, that was a powerful story of how Swami can show himself at crucial moments in our lives and that he's always watching over us. I am Prabha Swaminathan and thank you for joining today's episode of Sai Soul 100, Stories of Unconditional Love with Prashanti Kamula. Until next time, Jai Sai Ram.